The CDC recently released recommendations regarding booster doses for the COVID-19 vaccines. Are they necessary? Do they work? Are they the best way to use our resources? That's the topic of this week's healthcare triage. One caveat before we begin. This episode was written and filmed in November of 2021. As more data emerge, we may learn more and this may inform new perspectives. For now though, let's dive in. First, keep in mind that vaccine booster shots are common. This isn't newly developed for the COVID vaccine. Some vaccines, particularly those that don't contain live virus, offer less protection against disease over time. To counteract this, we administer booster shots. One example of this is the vaccine for tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis, the Tdap vaccine, for which a booster is recommended every 10 years. So how is the timeline looking for COVID vaccines? Is immunity waning fast enough that boosters seem necessary? Several studies have been published over the last couple months looking at the real-world outcomes over time for the vaccines. These studies use a couple of methodologies, most commonly either cohort studies or test-negative case control trials. The cohort studies follow two groups, one vaccinated and one unvaccinated, and see how their outcomes compare over time. Whereas the test negative case control trials compare characteristics, such as vaccination status between patients who tested positive for COVID and patients who tested negative. This can also be done by comparing COVID hospitalizations to non-COVID hospitalizations. These studies have been looking for evidence of waning immunity by comparing efficacy in groups split up by time since vaccination. We've talked about the importance of looking at clinically relevant outcomes countless times. As we mentioned in a recent episode, overall efficacy against COVID infections is a much less useful outcome than protection against serious infections, hospitalization, and death. When it comes to the vaccines, we are much more concerned about severe illness than we are about a positive COVID test accompanied by mild symptoms. With that in mind, to the research. Roughly 10 large studies have been published looking at how COVID vaccines prevent severe disease and how this changes over time. The evidence for weakening protection is less than convincing. Pretty much all the studies have pointed to very minimal change, if any, and of those, the ones that showed the greatest changes have large levels of statistical uncertainty, limiting their usefulness. So, from the data we have, it's difficult to make strong claims about the vaccines losing the ability to prevent hospitalization or severe disease. The data are more convincing when it comes to waning protection from all COVID infections, but like we said before, this is much less important. We should insert here that in the United States, boosters were recommended for all recipients of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. This one-shot vaccine showed 66% efficacy against moderate to severe disease, considerably lower than the mRNA vaccines, which clocked in above 90%. But most current data bring the utility of other booster shots into question. If the original shots are still protecting against severe disease, are boosters really necessary for more groups? Back to the research! An observational trial of adults in Israel who elected to receive a booster showed a fairly significant decrease in relative risk reduction for severe infections and an absolute risk reduction to 7.5 cases per 100,000 person days. I want to emphasize that this was not an experimental trial, so the results should be assessed with that in mind. First, the booster and control groups had differences at baseline. The booster group had more people over age 70, more men, and is subject to confounders that may not have been accounted for, such as social behavior. Receiving a booster shot could change disease-related behavior in a number of ways. Additionally, this study focused on a very specific population, people over 60. Finally, the period studied was short, spanning less than one month, so it's hard to draw very strong conclusions for the long term. On October 21st, Pfizer and BioNTech announced results from a phase three randomized controlled trial with over 10,000 people 16 years and older. According to a press release, the booster shot showed a favorable safety profile and restored protection against all cases to the level initially achieved after the second dose, which they previously reported to have waned from 96 to 84% four months following the second dose. But like we said before, preventing all cases isn't the most important factor. And we've got one more thing to address, equity. There are still massive disparities in vaccine distribution, with fewer than 10% of people vaccinated in most low-income countries. As several prominent scientists recently wrote in The Lancet, any ultimate gain of boosting is going to be outweighed by the gain from deploying our current supply of vaccines to places where few are vaccinated. In this way, we can inhibit new variants from emerging, a critical component of bringing this all to an end. The bottom line is this. 
The FDA and CDC have pretty much made it so that almost anyone who wants to get a booster in the United States can now get one. If you've got one of a gazillion of physical or mental health conditions, or if you believe you're at higher risk, you qualify. If you believe you fit the criteria that the CDC put forward, you should talk to your doctor about considering a booster vaccine. But it's not the same decision as it was for initial vaccination. For many, the data are still in flux and our resources may be better spent elsewhere. We'd like to give special thanks to our contributing writer, Elliot Rappaport, who did the heavy lifting for this episode. Hey, did you enjoy this episode? You might enjoy this previous episode on Medicare for All and wages. We'd appreciate it if you'd like and subscribe down below and consider going to patreon.com slash healthcare triage, where you can help make the show bigger and better, even during a global pandemic. We'd like to especially thank our research associates, James Glasgow, Joe Sevitz, Edward Lillaholm, and Brian Nam, and of course, our Surgeon Admiral, Sam.